Okay, so we can move right ahead to the next panel. And uh, um, this next panel will have uh, um, Marike Paulson, who is a um, professor at the University of Miami. She's the director of the International Arbitration Program at the University of Miami. She is uh, um, very knowledgeable in the in the area and very respected worldwide. And it's always interesting to say that she's Dutch Indian. So she's someone who has this great understanding of different cultures around the world, which is one of the subjects that we mentioned in the previous uh, panel. And then we have Vitor Castro, who uh, was just obtained his LLM from King's College London. And he received the prize of uh, number one best dissertation at King's College London, so that's quite a laudable uh, achievement. And then we have Antonio Vargas de, Vieira, de um, Oliveira Figueira, who is uh, um, the executive director of uh, FUSPI, which is the foundation at the University of Sao Paulo, where our center will be uh, administered. So the, the foundation, we're very thankful to have you here as well. And uh, um, last but certainly not least, uh, Enrique Iglesias, who was one of our um, distinguished chair at Catedra José Bonifácio in the year of 2014, Chancellor of Uruguay and the former president of the Inter-American um, Inter Development Bank for, I think, I believe 20 years, right? Um, <laughs> and uh, he had a very interesting initiative a few years ago. Um, his idea about also creating an Iberian American Center for Arbitration, which started to develop during the time when he was Secretary General at the General Secretariat for Iberian um, America in Madrid. So uh, I'd like to open this panel possibly with uh, you. Um, yes. <laughs> so you tell what some of your ideas were back then when you thought about the importance of international arbitration and also about peace and cooperation in Iberia America. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I don't think I can add very much to what our distinguished members of the panel and what the previous ones said about the issue, which is not my special area of concern. But yes, when I was in the Inter-American Development Bank, we felt that we had a lot of problems that reached the judiciary system and were becoming very, very complicated to solve, and then a long list of things without being solutions. So we tried to develop in the chambers of commerce uh, specific areas for, for trade arbitration, and I think they went pretty well. I am very happy because everybody started to work, and they became a lot of uh, alleviation to the judiciary because it was a good way to solve things in, in, a, in a practical matter. And I think it went very well. Later on, we tried to to do something for Ibero-America community, uh, Portugal, Spain, and the Portuguese and Spanish-speaking countries, in terms of uh, Ibero-American Court of Justice, which I think is doing very well. But I left the bank uh, uh, quite a few years ago. I don't know much how it is working, but in any way, that was an idea which I, I was very, very, very pushy in order to help the Latin American countries in solving they are uh, commercial particular issues. Now, let me, let me add only a few comments on, on, on the, first of all, con congratulations to the university for uh, establishing this institute, I think, and being concerned about peace. I, I, I had the privilege to be in the streets of Montevideo in 1945 as a student, of course, uh, just uh, welcoming the, the end of the war and the establishment and the, of the United Nations for our generation was the the, 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 the the big dream that war was an end forever. And as the preamble of the charter says, we, the people of the world, decided to eliminate the, world, the war from. Well, that was really a major shock. And then we believed for me in that that was uh, really the beginning of an area of peace. When I look back to these 70 years, well, I think they did not so badly in the world when you look both the political, the economic, the social, or the international relations. Uh, you see, in, in a way, we avoided the big, the Third World War, which was with us as a major concern for many years. I still remember 
on the Korean War in the 50s, everybody thought that we were going to go into an... Well, that was... Then 150 countries became, were born in the world after the UN was created. We had a lot of social progress uh, in terms of reduction of poverty from 50% to 10%. Uh, middle classes appear to be now in expansion. 42% of the, of the people of the world now are considered to be middle classes and they continue to grow. The economy multiplied for three or four times. Uh, and we had a, a, lot, a lot of advancements in the area of, of, of uh, technology. And so in a way, the best thing also was to build up an international system of multilateral organizations, which is an excellent answer to meet the concerns of the world as a whole through the instruments of negotiations and a multilateral concerns. Well, I think this, all of this system, which, as I said, went pretty well, and today the world is clearly much better than it was in 1945, but still there are major threats, which from my area, which is the economy and a little bit of politics and, and social side, I, I, are very important concern, and this is why peace should be preserved as an area of permanent commitment and concern by everybody, and particularly in these institutions which are responsible to or with the new generations. The first concern, of course, is that we have now in the world the revival of the old, the old uh, civilizational confrontations, particularly the three ones, the whole question of races, of religions, of nationalities. This is really something which uh, is there with us in a, very, in, in a very dramatic way and continues to be with very important very important uh, repercussions in, in, in the way we move in this world, particularly the implications of migrations. So this is a, a first area which I think requires a lot of political action from the countries that want to preserve peace as a way of living. But there is a second issue, which I think is, I, I am very much for the United Nations. I'm a, I was working for 20 years there, and I believe in the UN, not, not this, no, ignoring the, 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 the problems we have, but the UN was the belief that through dialogue and negotiations, we could build up a better world, and we could preserve peace. This is weakening. The UN is losing ground in a very dramatic way, starting by the Security Council. You see, and you are now open to in, individual decisions, which they are, you have Crimea, Ukraine, the sea, of, the sea of, of China. Things are happening in which you can see that the authority in which you believe the force was put for is being become and is weakening. It's weakening also something which is, to me, extremely dangerous for peace, which is that the, the, whole, the whole building of international negotiations particularly in trade negotiations, is being weakening. But this is the beginning of the so-called trade wars, which will be very dangerous for peace. And in, 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 the, in, the, in, in, in the beginning of new ways to look to of the big nations, which are now looking to individual negotiations instead of relying on multilateral negotiations. For the small countries, I'm coming from Uruguay, this is very serious. We fought for, for, re, for, for international negotiations on trade, opening the market, so becoming really a, a way in which we, we deal with negotiations to, to build up a, 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 a living, a comfortable living in the world. This is in danger today. And I think uh, this is very serious because if, if this happens and we enter into this series of confrontation in terms of trade, this is the beginning of establishing areas of influence as we had between 1914, and, and we have serious risks of entering into conflicts and entering into surprises of any kind. So to me, this is a very serious problem, which I believe that uh, is something which should be dealt by the whole question of, of, of being concerned about peace. And of course, the other area which is, is also becoming uh, very important in, in all these international matters is how we, why we do to preserve a major concept, which is a creation of the last 70 years, which is the concept of solidarity. Solidarity. Well, this is the new thing of the world of today. Before it was charity, no? But charity is, is the son of love. But solidarity is the son of justice. And we must preserve solidarity. That well 
of, the, of 45 plus, what's the way? Sorry, all these things are in danger. And if these things are in danger, peace is, is, can be threatened. This is why I think that in a way to be concerned about that is very important. And the last point has to do with internal issues. You see, I, I, the market system started to, to be the big winner in this fight in the last 50 years. Thanks to that, we have the growing economy. Uh, we have uh, the possibility of having uh, a lot of problems related to poverty, middle classes. But there is one thing we could not achieve, which was, was distribution, equality. The increase in inequality is a major threat to peace internally. Because in a way, inequality is a way in which people start to become unhappy. And this is what is going on in the world. People are unhappy. And everybody is a little bit better, but it's worse than the ones which are upstairs. And then everybody feels unhappy, and as a result, we are having now the birth of these new nationalisms, of these new authoritarian regimes, and particularly of the new populistic trends from the right and from the, and from the left. Well, to me, this question of inequality are really something which also are major threats to peace in the world of today and should be dealt with. This is why international is the weakening of the United Nations, the whole situation dealing with the, the, the destruction of the in, international system of negotiation, and internally the whole question of, of uh, this sort of la la lack of capacity to deal with inequality are all things which I think sooner or later we shall be, you should deal with. In particular, the young generations should be alert that we must preserve the best thing we have done in the last 70 years, which is not to have a third world war. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Don Hickey for those very wise words. And now I would like to uh, move forward with Vitor, Vitor Castro, so you can share some of your thoughts with us, please. Uh, thank you, Gerson. I, I would like to first to congratulate uh, the University of Sao Paulo for this initiative and the uh, Conflict Resolution Center. It's a, it's a very distinguished uh, honor just to be here uh, with this distinguished panelist. And uh, obviously, uh, I appreciate the invitation to be in this panel. Uh, and, well, I will obviously take the benefit of uh, speaking right after Don Enrique uh, and to discuss a bit about what is happening with this changing world that we have nowadays. So, uh, as a society, should we have a reflection on uh, what have we been promoting in the past years? Have we been promoting more conflicts or have we been trying to promote peace among the relations that we have? Uh, it seems that sometimes we are more prone to uh, you know, incentive conflicts. And if you go to the legal branch, we usually have several initiatives to try to uh, reduce the overload of courts. More recently, try to reduce some of the overload of some uh, arbitration tri tribunals, uh, reduce some of the costs, understand a bit about, you know, the con or taking care about the conflicts that we usually have. But have we been thinking about other ways to reduce conflicts and maybe promote more peace or more peaceful solutions that would be more feasible for the society. Of course, in the past uh, 40 years or so, we have been discussing more often about alternative dispute resolution uh, uh, methods. And arbitration has been you know, one of the stars of these methods because it has been proven to be more efficient for uh, to solve disputes. But is it really necessary to solve all disputes? I mean, what is the benefit of really solving a dispute instead of maybe settling a dispute? Are we getting more benefits in just trying to define which party has more power? Or should we make more efforts to try to find a synergy between the parties that might be more beneficial for the society as a whole. This is a question that we have to ask for ourselves whenever we are discussing about the possibilities of this changing world and what we intend to do. Of course, we can discuss that in a more general picture, what states have been doing 
these new policies, uh, as we have discussed more recently about the raise of the ultra-right parties in Europe, or even the Trump administration more recently. <laughs> but also, for our private sector, what have we been doing to promote peace? If you think about the Brazilian case, this is an interesting uh, fact. Uh, in the past two years, we discussed a lot about the new uh, rules of the Code of Civil Procedure. What have we changed on that? We basically pr tried to promote uh, more initiatives uh, to obviously reduce the number of appeals, maybe try to create some incentives for arbitration or respect arbitral awards, which is obviously apparently something relevant. And we created this um, consideration hearing, so the initial hearings that are mandatory to try to settle case at first. But have we really thought if this is what our society is looking for? It seems that we are just thinking about you know, more practical ways to reduce, as I mentioned, the overload of work. And we might have to think about what the parties could do to promote this peace and you know, this joint effort to solve problems. Uh, I'm a, a huge enthusiast about mediation, and uh, well, Professor Martin Hunter knows that because <laughs> he supervised my the dissertation that uh, Gerson uh, mentioned at first when he was presenting this panel, and uh, it was basically to understand that maybe a true mediation we can really look at what the parties want. So if you take a look at what the parties really really want while negotiating a case or while putting a conflict to be sorted by a court or a tribunal, you can make an effort to see that the parties themselves might be able to find a way to uh, basically reach an outcome that might be favorable for both disputants and to avoid that a third party, even an arbitrator or a judge, just decides that and maybe give a solution that, from the legal standpoint, might <laughs> look correct, but might not be efficient for the parties. So it seems that, in a scenario that the world is changing, we might have to promote more initiatives for the parties that are prone to have disputes, to really take a deeper step and see if they could try to promote peace by themselves using these tools that are available. Mainly, I would suggest, obviously, that the parties could take a deeper look at the interest-based mediation. So they could try to sit on a table and discuss what are the best initiatives that they could have of, instead, have, instead of having a decision rendered by a third party, uh, they could try to have a joint effort to keep relationships, to develop more business, and based on that, uh, avoid all the costs that we would have with disputes, so being more cost-effective. And of course, um, as a consequence, we would reach some of the other um, outcomes that we are expecting, like the overload, reduce the overload of work of some courts and tribunals, and therefore courts and tribunals could really take a, a deeper look at the matters that unfortunately can't be sorted through this consolidation of the parties. So those are just a few words um, for this audience to think about some of the changes that we might have for the future, instead of just promoting conflicts as it seems to be our uh, trend to try to promote more peaceful uh, tools to uh, sort out conflicts. Uh, I appreciate that, and I, I think we are all eager to hear other, other panelists, so I'm not going to extend a bit more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vitor, for sharing your uh, thoughts with us. I'd like to ask now Professor Figueira, uh, to uh, Executive Director of the USP Foundation, FUSPI, to share some of his thoughts with us. I know that you have acted, this is not exactly your field, but you have uh, acted as an expert in uh, arbitrations before, so maybe you could share some of your thoughts with us, please. Thank you, Professor Gerson. First of all, I'd like to thank the invitation. Uh, I'm totally outside this field, so it's really uh, uh, it'd be very hard for me to 
give contributions to the, the subject itself. But I would like to use the opportunity as a first, as I consider the, our foundation, uh, the partner of this conflict resolution center, uh, will be the managing partner of this center. So I'm very happy to be here. And I'll give you a little bit for our, our uh, guests, just to give a, a very brief overview about our foundation uh, and share some thoughts about that. And I'll eventually talk a little bit of, of our experience on that. So we, we have a, the University of Sao Paulo has a lot of foundations that support their, their work. There's around 30 or 34 foundations that support the, the University of Sao Paulo, different from other universities abroad. Uh, but uh, we are different, of course. Uh, we are, we've been uh, uh, in our board, the president of the university, the rector, uh, Professor Zago, he's the head of our board. So we are, we are the, the, in the foundation that is closest to the administration of the, the university. So we are a non-profit private organization that was established 25 years ago. Uh, we have a board of trustees with nine members. Five are appointed by the, the president of the university and uh, the other three are elected by the university board. So, as I said, we are very close to the university administration. We, uh, we have a, a, a small team of directors, myself, uh, another finance director and a deputy director that manage the daily operations of our foundation. Uh, basically, the idea for the foreigners that are not familiar with the difficulty of running a university, a public university in Brazil. It's really hard to manage funds and hire people and everything. So uh, the foundation uh, system has been established trying to help the university to be able to achieve some of the goals like uh, uh, research and development projects or uh, continuing education courses and things like that. So if you want to do these kind of things inside the university, it's really very difficult, very hard, takes a long time. So we are outside the university trying to, to help in this matter. Uh, so we, we, we have uh, funds from different sources, uh, Brazilian official agencies and uh, uh, foreign foundations like Ford Foundation, uh, European Committee, Community uh, Commission. Uh, we have uh, different companies like Boeing or the United States Air Force uh, finance some projects through us. So we are, we, we, we are busy on trying to manage this and try to attend all the needs for the coordinators, which usually have to be a faculty from the, the university. Uh, grossly, we have uh, around 80 to 100 million reais, which would be like 25 to 30 million dollars of projects on a year basis coming to our foundation. So it's kind of uh, it's a large amount of money for to to manage, and uh, hopefully one of these projects that we're gonna uh, embrace and be part of is the conflict resolution center of Professor uh, Damiani. Uh, one of the things we have, and it makes our lives a little bit more difficult. Uh, we are a non-profit of private organization, but uh, you use a lot of, uh, uh, we have a lot of humanity for different taxes. So there's a lot of people auditing us and this is a source of a lot of conflicts for us because it's sometimes you're not clear in Brazil to have the, the right uh, law framework for establishing some of the, some of the, you know, the, the rules for some of these uh, organizations. Uh, so, we have uh, more people controlling us than, you know, helping us. So it makes things very difficult. As I said, we are a private non-profit organization, but uh, we have funds from the federal government, from state government, from municipalities, you know, the, the, the city of Sao Paulo, and uh, different funding agencies that go through our uh, system. We also have a lot of funds from direct private companies, but also some cases in the, the system we have in Brazil indirect through tax exemptions, tax breaks, like the, the, the regulatory agencies, like uh, the, the oil national agency or electric energy, uh, electric energy agency, they, they have uh, some tax breaks, the companies have some tax breaks for, and they are obliged to, to use this for R&D, so they have to come through us. So this is where the problem starts, because we have uh, public funds coming from uh, private contracts. So it, this is really a, a nightmare for us because there's a lot of auditing. Uh, as a foundation, there's a very strict control and uh, there's a, a state audit office or Tribunal de Contas that, that everybody heard about. The state audit office have to check our accounts. Uh, there's a specific uh, public prosecutor that takes care of all foundations in this city. So we have to also uh, uh, 
follow his rules and uh, and have to uh, audit by by him uh, the university itself and also you have a uh, private auditors that have to go through our uh, accounts uh, in a sense it's very good as if you want to according to the, the previous panel that uh, clean hands is something important for us. It's really important that we have a, a very good, clear uh, uh, record in terms of uh, accounts. Uh, one, another problem that we have is a lot of uh, legislation. The legislation framework, regulatory framework was established for federal foundations, but uh, the state of Sao Paulo, we don't have one specific one. So that's the problem. We have a we don't have a strict rules for what you have to follow. So according to the, the auditing, we, we have to follow different rules. So our work is, is very uh, hard on that. So there is, um, we are actually in a, the, the foundations in the state of Sao Paulo, the, the link to the state universe in a, is in a legal limbo because we, we have to follow some of the federal, but uh, sometimes they don't, they don't agree on that, some of the, the, the auditing that we have to go through. Uh, one thing that we, 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 we feel is that uh, recently there's a, uh, and I guess one of the problems with, with in, in Brazil is the culture. I guess, uh, I believe the arbitration is a clear, is a, listening to the, the previous speakers, uh, culture is a, is, a, is a very important component on that and it's very critical if you go uh, you know, across boards on that. Uh, in Brazil, we are changing a little bit of our culture. I mean, some of the movements that are being uh, outside, like the legislation on compliance, anti-bribery, you know, the FCPA, UKBA, things now are affecting Brazil because a lot of international companies are following some of these rules and things are getting a little bit better. Uh, and also in Brazil, the, the environment is becoming a little bit uh, more, you know, favorable, but still is a culture. Uh, change that we need to 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 have to be able that you know people will follow stricter rules and follow some of the uh, of, of this. So the recent years, uh, one of the major finances we have is Petrobras. Uh, well, three or four or five years ago, this was a, like a synonym of uh, correctness, and and you 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 heard the news. Uh, so this is another problem for us, and uh, they are becoming very strict, and for us it's giving a, a lot of work. Uh, so, what, what happened with us, and why I'm saying all this, is that we, we work as a, a third sector, so we are not private and public, so there's a lot of uh, problems in legislation for us, and it's really hard how do you, we, we, we act in some cases, and it's very easy to, to get into trouble because you don't follow some of these, of some of these rules, so this is a, 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 a very critical place, critical point, and uh, one of the things that I uh, experience and I'm really happy to be here and to, to listen to all the speakers, uh, some of the proposition about things, how they can uh, go, uh, you know, from, from the future and be able to, to have a better uh, way of dealing with the, with the foundation. Uh, Dr. Damiani mentioned earlier, I was, when I was a graduate student, I did my PhD at Purdue University in the, the U.S. Uh, I was invited, I never heard that before, but I was invited to Hawaii which is, it was a terrible thing, to be an expert witness in, a, in arbitration between a, you know, two companies there. And then I never heard of that, and I, I spent like three or four days there because of that, and it was a, a great experience to, to learn that. And, and, and before that, I, I, I'm a, actually I'm a plant molecular biologist, so I have not even in human science or anything close to that. So I'm a you know, hard scientist, and it was a great experience to see that, and, uh, and now, when I got in touch back with, with, with Gerson about this project of the center, we kind of found a lot of things in common, and uh, we are here, and ho hopefully we can help uh, this initiative. Thank you very much. Sorry for not speaking on the, on the thing, but uh, at least I did some uh, commercial for, my, uh, for our foundation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Professor Figueira. I think that shows, I mean, the importance of having the foundation of the University of Sao Paulo, who is really based on um, a very ethical approach towards its work, and it's more than three decades of uh, operation. And uh, it's also interesting that you mentioned, when you mentioned your experience as an expert witness, I thought about how the University of Sao Paulo can provide expert witnesses in the very many fields of uh, economical and um, affairs and trade. So now we'll move on to Marike Paulson, who will share her thoughts uh, with us. Please, Marike. Thank you. 
I apologize for eating candy, which I never do, but my five-year-old son gave me a cough as stubborn as he is. So I will try to get through this without choking. Um, I know it's a discussion, but I prepared a little story, which will be about six minutes. Especially because today, in two hours from now, we will know whether Geert Wilders one, I have my Dutch friends on WhatsApp who will keep us posted. In times of Brexit, Nexit, Frexit, and Trump, and I hope not, Geert Wilders, our world order is again in a state of crisis. The world at large has hit the panic button, and what they do not do, as one would do in England, is keep calm and carry on. So this panic could lead to a self-fulfilling prophecy um, with an exodus of parties moving their dispute resolution elsewhere, moving it from Europe, moving it away from the United States. The prophecies are already being made about Asia being on the rise. So where does Latin America stand? in a world that was for very long dominated by the Old West. And as I am a professor, I love to teach my young students about history. So I will talk a little bit about history. For it enables us to understand the present and it will allow us to address the future. When nation states around the world sign treaties such as the European Convention of 61, the New York Convention, the Washington Convention, and other United Nations treaties. Old states and newly formed states acceded to it. But there was one thing that they did not give up. It was state sovereignty. And Fali Nariman, who is called the living legal legend of India, compares this sovereignty with billiard balls. They collide often, but they do not move in the same direction. And this is what he called the Westphalia Syndrome. The treaties of Westphalia are actually of 1648. And they were supposed to end the 30 years war that was then called the Holy Roman Empire. And with that treaty, the Westphalian treaties, we saw a modern era at the time of nation states. This was a new system. Of its kind, a political order called the Westphalia Sovereignty. And this was based on this concept of a sovereign state. And that is something which we call now democracies or the peoples. And this Treaty of Westphalia, so old, is very important for us to understand international law because this was the beginning of the development of international law. It created the basis of self-determination. Post-World War II, a new world order was created to prevent World War III. And what we had post-World War II is what we call the Pax Americana. And some might say that the U.S., was, I don't know is, the leader of the free world. And one wonders, this order, this post-World War II order, is it under threat because of the Trump administration? Could the U.S. still be the leader of the free world? I will now make a crossover to arbitration. We saw an international law in the world order, the Pax Americana. What we have seen in international arbitration is the Americanization of international arbitration. A year ago, I proposed that what we might see is the Latinization of international arbitration. Why? Because the Old West, the Europe as we knew it, is weakened. The US, under the current administration, is a threat to the international order as we knew it. Of the old, strong European nations that dominated the world of international law and world trade, 
only Germany is still standing strong. And if the outcome today in the Netherlands is not what we are hoping for, we'll see a domino effect in Belgium and France. And that was my reference to Nexit and Frexit. Under the Trump administration, the ban was introduced with global consequences. TTP is dead, and we're now awaiting what is going to happen to NAFTA. Donald Trump has called us, the, the scholars of international law, eggheads, and that was meant to be an insult. I would like to emphasize that treaties need to continue to shape the international world order. This is how nations coexist, and this is also how nations are willing to sacrifice a part of the sovereignty. Right now, that, in, that sovereignty, but also international comity, is under threat. It is under threat with cases like Pemex involving Mexico, where a lower court U.S. judge slapped the Mexican Court of Appeal judges on the fingers. It is under threat with the discussions about this wall. It brings us back to 1945. Um, if we look at the Pax Americana, and we look at the democracies as, they, as we still know them today, we need to think about how we preserve this. Right now, we find ourselves in the situation where we went from Cold War to a Putin-Trump bromance. It might sound funny, but it's not. So what do we do? We need a very strong response to denial of justice and to this defiance of the international rule of law of a head of state, but it happens to be the head of the United States of America. We can no longer rely on the strong European nations to do this. And with that, I turn to Latin America, and I turn to this Global Institute for Peace Studies, and I turn to this Conflict Resolution Center with proposals and food for thought. We must think about, again, the role the United Nations could play. We must address the fact that maybe the role of the United Nations has weakened. Right now, it is very important that the United Nations becomes strong again because of the weakening of the nations that led this world order as we knew it. We need to think about how we bypass the hurdles that the Security Council could pose. We need to look at Examples such as UNCITRAL, the ECOSOC, which provided a home for the New York Convention with 157 contracting states, and the UN Women. I feel I must mention that one as I'm the only woman on this panel and I actually attended the UN headquarters last Monday for the week on the Commission on the Status of Women, which saw the launch of the Global Award for Women. All these things, these committees, are or ought to be inspiration for this global institute and for the, the conflict resolution center. We might think about, um, do we want to have committees or a think tank or a work group? And think about, do we want to collaborate with the UN? It is not so impossible. But to talk about the Pax Americana, and to talk about the World Compact, I have to go back to, is something impossible or not? Pete Saunders, who passed away in 2012 at the age of 100, was the father, the founding father of international arbitration. He and Holtzman, Robert, Holo are the ones who created international arbitration and conciliation. Pete Saunders is the one who proposed that mediation is going to be the future. He told us so in 2010. They created the system that we know today of alternative dispute resolution. With my discussions about this changing world order, we are again at a crossroads. And it's up to our community to think about, do we want to redesign it again? And I think we must. So Latin America. Certain nations in this region have defied international law. They have denounced bilateral investment treaties, 
Some have denounced the exit convention, the Washington Convention. Some commit denial of justice. So the biggest challenge for international law here is, what do we do with corruption? And certain governments and heads of states denying the international rule of law. Because it's also in this region where those billiard balls collide too much. So what is pivotal for international law in this region, as it is right now in the United States, is that we shift from democracy and distrust to what I call in Dutch, in Latin, the trias politica of Montesquieu. And I would like to emphasize, and I would like to tap back into what I heard today is, there is always a crossover from private and international tribunals to courts. There is always a crossover from sovereigns implementing policies in their territories on the one hand, and these sovereigns being held accountable under international law, is what we call state responsibility. So to conclude, another final bit of this story. At the London Court of International Arbitration, the Centenary Conference in London, Martin, 95. Some old stalwarts, not you, Judge Howard Holtzman, Judge Stephen Swabel, they envisaged for the 21st century these, this new International Court for Resolution of Conflicts. And I am now quoting Fali Nariman. These worthy gentlemen, being fine arbitrators and, quote, men of the world, they also recognized that setting up this international court would be tilting at the windmills of national sovereignty. And Judge Swabel recalled the theme of a song of a very popular movie at the time, The Man from La Mancha, where the principal character, Don Quixote, who is a dreamer, always dreamed this impossible dream. And Schrabel said that international court was an impossible dream. So here we are today with this new institute and the Conflict Resolution Center. And I would like to ask the actors in Latin America to rethink their role and to define their mandate in these changing times, a new world order and a reshift of powers. So I would like to remind everybody in this room of another phrase of Fali Nariman from India. International law has perhaps not achieved much, but it's good that it's there. So let's continue that journey to aim for a full implementation of international rule of law for this new world order and look back at the United Nations. And I have full confidence that this global institute with my friend Jay um, can take on these challenges. And I think you'll be courageous enough. I'll be courageous with you. And let's have the courage to design a new method of dispute resolution. Let's collaborate with the United Nations to think about what peace is. And let's be an answer to Trump and Le Pen and Flams Bloch and Geert Wilders. And I think that dream is not impossible, and we just need to go back to the days for Martin Hunter and the man from La Mancha. Thank you. Marike Paulson, thank you very much for this brilliant and inspirational contribution. I mean, we all need this uh, today. And... Uh, um, you know, when we first started thinking about the Center for Conflict Resolution, one of the things that inspired us was the idea of, you mentioned the, the role of Latin America, and you mentioned inequality, uh, Don Henrique. And um, when I think about Brazil and the role of Brazil, with our more than 25,000 kilometers of border with land and uh, water, uh, we are probably a country of this dimension, the only country of this dimension that I mentioned that went through the past century without any war with our neighbors. So we are a country that have a lot to bring and contribute to the world as far as peace is concerned. I mean, we are able, we're a continental country that has been able to live with its neighbors in a situation of peace 
for such a long time. And uh, um, we live in a situation, our internal situation is certainly much more difficult, much more difficult concerning some of the ideas that you mentioned, Don Henrique, because of inequality. And inequality produces conflict. But I think that we can, uh, the university has the role of uh, bridging this inequality and fostering inclusion. Um, we have maybe one minute if anybody would like to make a comment on the, or ask a question for the, for the panel. Wonderful, by the way. Marie, oh. um, The elimination of poverty is the biggest problem facing the world today, is it not? And one thing our institute can do, perhaps, is to make a difference there, because which Dr. Samantha in the east coast of India, he's dedicated his life to the elimination of poverty uh, and is doing well. But, you know, if we could get a real movement could start in Brazil, because we're not going to get it from the United States, frankly. The United States, it, it, it always, they're in denial about it, of course, but there are 40 million people living in America in poverty, by which I mean under the trees or, you know, just no assets, no food. Hmm? Sorry, I've, I've spoken too much anyway. <laughs> I, I think I, I agree with you, Professor. This is true. But I, and, and I think, uh, to me personally, I think poverty will be managed. It's not, so, it's not so problematic in a way to meet. In a way, it used to be 45% 50 years ago. Now it's 10% of the world population. So poverty has been proved by policies that can be really met. Inequality is much more complicated. Because the system as such tends to accumulate wealth in a small sector of society. And to fight this sort of problem, this is really implies a lot of, a lot of policy, a lot of political power, a lot of vision. And, and this is lacking in a way. People today are angry in the world. They are angry with everything. And they are angry because simply they feel that they were unable to meet their, 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 their dreams. Their, and they, as such, since everybody is pushing new aspirations, because they sit at the television every day, and they, they consider to be unhappy, and then they are angry. Since they are angry, they vote against. They voted against in case of the United States. They voted against Brexit. I don't know what's going to, to happen today in, 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 in Holland. But I think, uh, to me, inequality continues to be the challenge because it's the only thing in which the market economy has not been successful. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Any further comments? Okay, so on that note, I would like to, to thank our panel. I think that everybody would agree with me that this was a very fruitful and inspirational discussion. Thank you very much.